Hi, and welcome to Keeping It 100 in Medicine. I'm Dr. Danielle, a third year physical medicine and rehab resident. And in today's video, I wanna give you some tips and tricks for this residency application season. I'm gonna be going over the ERAS application. So if you're interested, please keep watching. So the ERAS application is basically your resume or your CV. And a lot of the residency programs will be looking at this prior to giving you an interview, and they may even have your ERF application up while they're interviewing you. So you wanna make sure you fill it out to the best of your ability. And I'm just gonna pull it up on my screen and go over the different sections with you guys. Okay, so we are going to look at this ERAS uh, 2024 application worksheet. So to start off, obviously you're gonna put in your personal information, your name, whatever. Uh, just want to note for your email, you want to make sure this is an email that is linked to your phone where you will get notified. Uh, you may want to choose to make a new email that is separate from your regular email, just so um, any notifications you will get from ERAS, from programs for interviews, will not be lost in your um, email. So after that, obviously basic information, when you put in your address, um, it says the current mailing address at least has to be for the U.S. or Canadian address. Uh, this is pertinent, obviously, for people that are international. Have to pick a place where your potential mail from these programs will go. For work authorization, this is um, important for um, everybody. But um, if you're an international medical graduate, you want to make sure um, that you know the uh, type of visa that you have. I am a United States international medical graduate, so I'm not completely familiar with all the different titles that um, are used. But you want to make sure as you are, before you even do this ERAS application, hopefully you have the opportunity to look up the different residency programs and see the ones that are likely to take uh, people that have visas and are IMG friendly. So that can kind of guide you as you fill out the rest of this ERAS application, okay? Well, these are the various types of um, visas that they have. And if you haven't already gone on your ERAS application. So next is the NRMP. This is where the NRMP is the website where you will make your rank order list and you and the program will have this whole match situation later on in March. So that's the whole purpose of this section right here. For additional information, obviously you're going to put your USMLE E7G ID. If you have your ACLS, PALS, or BLS, that's great. Um, you're going to need that for when you start residency anyway, so if you have that, it's good to already have it and, and note the expiration dates. So, and more information about yourself. Good to specify if you can. Now, the language section. This is helpful for programs in specific areas where um, they will have a lot of patients that, let's say, speak French or speak Spanish, whatever. Um, and you can say how much you speak of that language. You want to be very honest. <laughs> Do not say that you are advanced if you are a basic French speaker, for example, because the interview interviewer might actually ask you uh, to, to speak with them in that language. So you just want to be prepared and if you have something that looks great. Military, you know, you, you know if you are in the military or not. Next we have hometown. This section will basically indicate to a program that perhaps you may be more interested in going to a specific area because this is where you are previously lived or you're currently there. That's the whole point of the hometown section. So next is the geographic preferences. This is new, or it was not on my ERAS application when I applied. Um, this is good 
but it can be bad potentially to specify. So um, if you only apply to certain regions, that's okay to specify and elaborate why you want to be um, in that specific area. However, um, if you intend to apply broadly, it may be a hindrance to specify a particular area. Um, so for example, think about yourself as a program director. If you are a program director and you like two applicants and one specifies that they want to live in the Northeast and you are a program director in a rural part in the Midwest, um, you may assume that that applicant may rank you lower than another applicant that um, did not specify um, a division of preference. So you again need to kind of think about what programs you're going to apply to and pick your geographic preferences accordingly. And you have up to three different um, preferences that you can put. And the same applies to setting preferences because you could specify um, rural, suburban, urban, no preference. And again, depending on where you actually apply, uh, intend on applying to, it may look good or bad. So here's your education section. You know, you know that information, hopefully have it readily available and just kind of fill in. If you did postgraduate training, interesting, add that there. Now, this additional information section. Here in the member and honorary slash professional society, uh, you would like to put any of your professional organizations to show that you are dedicated to that specialty. So for example, if you're applying to internal medicine, you may put the, I am, um, uh, they have the ACP, or for FM they use AAFP, for OB, ACOG, whatever, depending on the specialty. However, when you apply to multiple specialties, um, you basically have to justify or you may have to when you interview why you're in, you know, AFP and you're also in AAPMNR or whatever. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're filling out your um, US application. Um, I want to know this other awards as accomplishment section. They have removed the hobbies I see in this application. So this may be your section to put something that's not necessarily medically related that kind of shows you to be a little bit more well-rounded so this to me would be the substitute for the hobby section this little other awards or accomplishments area now getting into experiences this is good uh, you can put up to 10 experiences. Uh, your experience types, work, research, volunteering, teaching, whatever. Um, you can explain the frequency, setting, the characteristics. This is cool. They did not have this before. This is kind of explaining your character. Um, so the whole purpose of this part really is to reflect you as a person. What is your character qualities? Are you dedicated because you go, you know, weekly, monthly for like many years or whatever? Um, are you an altruistic person? This is the whole point of this whole like experiences section. This is kind of not a substitute for your personal statement, but it could be um, a way to go in for the detail about things in your personal statement that you may not have space to write about. This is what this selected experiences is for. And when you go to the context roles and responsibilities, you want to make sure that um, you describe what you did in as much detail as you can 
and talk about how it impacted you and made you a better person. That's what you should put for these um, context, roles, and responsibilities part. So you're going to put in up to 10 different entries. And then they have this other section where you can talk a little bit more about it. It's called this selective experiences. So of your 10, you already mentioned, and you probably wrote a decent amount about, you can write like three of the 10. Out of the 10, just write three, pick three in particular, and you're gonna tell which entry it was. And you're gonna give even longer, <laughs> more information about it. So this is kind of like removing parts of your personal statement is what this looks like, is what this little section is for, okay? So you don't want to like reiterate it in your personal statement, like in excessive detail, because you already mentioned it here. Now, this is new and interesting and optional. (laughs) This impactful experiences section. Um, It is for um, you to describe any challenges or hardships that influence your journey to residency um it could be you know family deaths or something in your family background you're the first person to go to medical school like me um that's what this is for but they specify that please consider whether this section applies to you programs do not expect all applicants to complete this section so don't feel like you need to make up something that you don't want to talk about because anything you put in your application is fair game for discussion in your personal statement. I mean, sorry, during your interview. Again, anything you put in your in your ERAS or your personal statement, whatever you write to these programs is fair game during the interview. So if you don't feel like this relates to you, you can believe it blank. I think this may be useful for people that had a gap in their um, pro like their residency journey because of a loss of a member they had to serve as caregiver for a while that is a good part but let's say you have like a red flag like you didn't pass a semester or um, you have an issue with like one of your step I guess exams failure or whatever um, I think that would be better to put here uh, in this additional information because it asks, was your medical education slash training extended or interrupted? Here, if you have like a red flag, you can put it, because you want to be transparent about any quote unquote red flags that you may have in your application, because some programs may see that, let's say you were in medical school for six years or whatever, that's not quote unquote normal to be in med school that long. So you, if you, had to repeat or something like that you can mention that here in this additional information i i do want to say that you definitely want to make sure you do not put your red flag in your personal statement i'll talk about later in the personal statement um section because i did have a red flag myself and I wrote it in my personal statement and that was (laughs) a bad idea I would say just leave your red flags here red flags stay here okay not your personal statement next uh we have your licensures if you have any licenses um be honest for this whole if anything has been medical license has been suspended revoked whatever you want to be very transparent to programs. They don't want to see you as like deceitful as I found out something later. So just kind of have it open and honest here. Um, for the publications, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory. If you have any uh, peer-reviewed journals, etc., book chapters, um, other articles, poster presentations now the oral presentation part um is interesting because you know obviously if you present on a conference you can put that here uh with the poster presentation and if it's oral you can mention it here as well um but you could technically say 
um, if you gave like a grand rounds presentation at some point at a hospital or you taught um, in a professional setting or something that was medically related, um, you could mention that technically in your oral presentation. The oral presentation would not really include like presentations during like your regular rounds, like bedside rounds or whatever, and not really like PowerPoint presentations during your rotations. It's more like you gave like a, a podium style presentation or a lecture, if you will. And when you're filling out this whole publication section, if you technically did not already present something orally or you have a publication or article that is expected to be released but not ready when you submit, you can still mention it in your application. And if anyone asks, um, you could say it's been approved, um, but it's not quite published yet. So you can mention it because you're going to be sending out these applications in September. But if it's approved now and you intend on having it done, uh, I don't know, in January, let's say, for whatever reason, you can mention that in your um, application, like early. Uh, last part really is this program signals um so apparently you can now signal programs depending on what uh, specialty you're applying to and they'll, some people have gold silver signals that's really interesting um uh this sounds good to do if you really are interested in a specific program it's kind of like a letter of interest kind of email I guess it's like substituting that I don't know if, if I was a program I was getting silver signal would I be too happy because I wasn't gold you know what I mean but <laughs> I think it's good to signal programs that you're like super interested in to show hey I like you pick me and again like I said before, hopefully you already looked at the programs that you want to apply to, so you will have an idea of which one you think one fits you, and um, you also think will likely pick you as well. And that's the end of your application. So you completed your ERS application and you are about to submit. You don't need to rush to submit your ERS application. You should at least submit it by that date that the residency programs will open your application so for the 2024 match that means you should have your ERS application completed and ready to submit by September 27th. For those who were like I was when I was applying who let's say they had their ERS done they had their letters of recommendation they just didn't have their step two score for whatever reason um, you can apply but it's risky and it was risky for me, which is why I ended up doing the whole uh, out of match situation. But if you get your step two score by at least sometime in early November, even though you submitted it, you will likely still get interviews, even if you don't have your step two score by September 27th, for example, for this year, for the um, match process. If you are not happy with your application because you're missing your step score or a letter of recommendation, whatever, you may opt to submit your ERAS application after September 27th. Um, you can submit in November, December, whatever. Um, it's just preferable to submit it by September 27th. But if you get af if you get your step two score after November, it's even more difficult if you don't already have interviews lined up. So just Keep that in mind when you are submitting your ERS application and you don't have, let's say, everything together, it is more difficult to match. There are cases where people will still match with, you know, getting their step score in like, let's say, December, but it's a little bit more risky. So you just want to weigh your options. The people that get that are the, the few and the blessed, let's say, but it is not for everybody. So just keep that in mind. So this concludes my video on the tips and tricks for the residency application process from ERA. I hope this video was helpful. 
And if you have any questions or comments or concerns, you can put them in the comment section below. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. Have a blessed day.